Georgie, is stock this up. Get in the Cortina, drive to a supermarket, and get those frozen goods in there. The chest freezer found its purpose in an era that saw an increase in car ownership and the rise of supermarkets. For the first time ever, the weekly, rather than daily, shop became a reality. George is shopping for the slideshow party, but she's only allowed to buy products that would have been available in the 70s. Wow, a lobster. That's really 70s. Cooked from frozen. Yeah. So perfect. I can go to the garage, grab it, stick it on a tray, put it straight on the table, ready for everybody to eat. This is so completely different to making dinner last night. Just all these frozen lumps of stuff. Mm, this looks good. Does it look good? Yeah, that looks good. Because it's all of that was in the freezer half an hour ago. I can see clear. 1976. Now in 1973. The year the number of colour television licences overtook those of black and white for the first time. Alan Weeks. Good evening and welcome to Pop Black's Gala Night. Hate snooker as it is, you have to watch it in black and white a lot. Snooker was brought to television by BBC Two controller David Attenborough to make the most of the new colour service. Kind of an interesting game. It's when not. you're watching it in black and white, it becomes even more challenging, I think. But the family won't have to struggle with snooker in black and white for much longer. Uh, with the old? Tom from the tech teams delivering them a new colour TV. Wire up then. Uh, there we are. Can I try it? Yeah, are you ready to see what would happen if a rainbow leaked into your old TV? Television viewing was Britain's biggest pastime in the 1970s, even though there wasn't much to watch. Which probably explains how the Generation game regularly ended up with almost half the country tuning in. Um, UV light, coffee, UV light, blender, blender fan heater, electric light, fruit. I can feel the family getting sucked into the technology and I'm still making jello in the kitchen. Good rumba action, strongly. But the colour TV doesn't seem to offer much excitement to Hamish. I still don't think I'm going to be watching it as much. The TV I'm used to, it has um, satellite, so there's lots more channels to go through and it hasn't got a remote, so you have to get up and put the bottom all the time. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. The three TV channels are about to face their first rival. Tom's back with the very latest in electronics, containing the first computer chip to enter the 1970s home. When we, when, when we first saw you, you were all playing video games. Yeah. Everybody in the house seemed to be hooked up to some sort of um, television yeah. or uh, excitement. So this is the first rung on that ladder back to your normality of video gaming. It's absolutely ah, brilliant. Ah, brilliant! I remember this. Hamish! The sad news is it's in monochrome. <laughs> so you'll enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. Here's a brand new idea from the United States which can turn your television set into a game that two can play. Unplug the aerial, plug in the electronic game simulator, switch on the set again, and now who's for tennis? Right, Wimbledon, here we come. You ready, Jen? Play. Oh, oh yeah, there we go. Is that sharp or not? Created by Atari in 1972, Pong is recognised as the first home video game. Soon, manufacturers worldwide, like Binatone, made their own versions and over 500 different systems flooded the market. Though the controls were kept to a bare minimum, just a single rotary knob, this is the beginning of the television as an entertainment emporium. It's quite clever, all it is, but... Obviously, Adam has more experience in these kinds of games.
It's 1977. While the Queen's Silver Jubilee flew the flag for tradition, revolution was breaking out. <laughs> the computer revolution. Computers were starting to make inroads into the workplace. But the era of the home computer was at least five years away. Gia's in search of any sort of computing power she can offer the family. Clearly, I can't give them a computer in the 70s. So I think it's got to be a calculator. And there's only one man to go to. He's the guy who brought calculators to the masses. My hero, Sir Clive Sinclair. When I've told people that I'm coming to meet you today, everyone just said, you have to tell him how important he is to me. He's changed oh, my life, oh, which, is, which is lovely. So thank you very much. Mm. Did you feel that it was important that the average person have some kind of contact with computers and calculators and... Well, phone? they were magical, of course, because prior to that, calculations were elaborate and you either used a slide rule or log tables, and then suddenly pocket calculators came along and, 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 and changed it all. These were something that was sort of all space agey and they caused a lot of excitement and that was rather fun to be involved with. Well, I've got the calculator for the family, Sinclair Cambridge. Now, when these things came out in the early 70s, they were incredibly expensive, but by now they were affordable. They were about $8.95. So anyone could afford these things. And they were still a bit of a status symbol, still very exciting to own. So I'm gonna give it to them now. Oh, look at that. It's a calculator. And your maths homework will be so quick and easy now because you can do it all on the calculator. Do you remember doing rude words on them? What, like boobs? Uh, do you remember what the number was? Uh, yeah, I think it's 58008, and then you look at it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> it's so infantile, I can't believe you know that. <laughs> Hamish has found a proper use for the calculator, his maths homework. Teachers at the time were anxious about their potential impact on children's arithmetical ability. Even so, the pocket calculator was unstoppable. In 1977, Britain bought nearly five million of them. But the meagre computing achievements of the 70s, Pong and the calculator, have brought home to Hamish how much he's missing 21st century technology. I'm quite bored. There's nothing really to do. So I've always got my computers and games and stuff. He's even resorted to helping Georgie with the housework. Nineteen seventy-eight, and industrial relations had reached a new low. Britain is stricken with its worst industrial problems for years. While Dennis Healy was attempting to freeze wages, Britain was shivering through the winter of discontent. Thirty-odd years later, snow covers Britain again, and Adam has a dilemma, whether or not to go into the office. Normally, I, I probably wouldn't go to work, actually. I'd probably work at home, because I've got broadband connections and, you know, direct link into the office and, and mobiles and all the technology that allows me to, to be mobile and, and work anywhere, really. Probably 30 years ago, I, I, I probably would have struggled in, I guess. <laughs> Going to work in this Cortina is, is crazy. It's just not up to the job. It, it's not engineered for this kind of thing. But having said that, people in the 70s did. So, you know, why shouldn't I? That's the question. Well, I'm not taking a Cortina out in this. It's crazy. I've got a four by four. I'm taking that. But before Adam arrives at his office, Gia is making a few modifications. Out goes the internet workstation, and in comes a Commodore PET computer. Work is certainly the first place people would have encountered a computer. And this one was, you know, massively high-tech. Software is loaded using a tape deck, which is both unreliable and slow. 
But the PET, with a basic word processor and spreadsheet, was a popular business machine into the 80s. Hello. Morning. <laughs> Look at that. 1978 today. I didn't think it was 1978. No. These came out in um, 1977, Commodore Pet. Really? Oh, I just assumed yep. it was a lot later than that. <laughs> no. So I know that you work in accountancy. I've